Hello and welcome. My name is John Horvath. This presentation is about civil engineering failures, specifically the failure of geostructural systems. A geostructural system is one where the geotechnical components, the ground and ground water, are the primary components of the system, but there may also be one or more structural elements embedded within the ground or on the ground. And this gravity retaining wall that we see in this photo is a very classical example of a geostructural system. So when we have a failure of a geostructural system, as we see in this case, the partial collapse of this retaining wall, it is natural to ask the questions, why and why now? Why did this failure happen in the first place? And why did it happen at this particular point in time? So answering the questions why and why now are the fundamental aspects of performing a forensic investigation of the failure of a geostructural system. This is an outline of my presentation. As you can see, I've divided it up into segments. This is to present the material in a logical fashion, as well as to facilitate your viewing this presentation. Depending on the time that you have available, you may find it advantageous to watch this presentation in segments. So as you can see, I'm going to discuss some basic concepts concerning geostructural failures and forensic investigations, and then I will discuss a case history in some detail. Well, to begin with, it's important to note that people generally build a structure. And by the way, in this presentation, I use the term structure in a very broad, generic context, uh, not necessarily a building. People build a structure with the implied, if not explicit, intent that it has some longevity for its intended purpose. Now, in the past, uh, historically, this longevity was typically open-ended and indefinite. And even nowadays, when we talk about a structure having a certain design life, uh, in reality, very often the design life is open-ended and indefinite. So a geostructural system, such as a retaining wall, is no exception to this. And this is a rather massive gravity retaining wall that was constructed in the early years of the 20th century in the Upper West Side of the borough of Manhattan in New York City. Uh, believe it or not, this was built by a homeowner uh, for a private residence, the residence being this rather imposing castle-like structure we see here. Uh, certainly a more substantial retaining wall than the average homeowner would build for their property. So if at some point in time a failure of all or part of a structure like this occurs, in this case a partial wall collapse that happened in the early years of the 21st century, it is, as I said, logical to ask the questions why and why now. And this is, in this case, especially true when less than a month before the failure, this photo was taken and the wall is still standing. I know obvious signs of failure, although as we will talk about uh, later in this presentation, uh, there was some rather visible substantial horizontal bulging mid-height of this wall. It's important to understand that geostructural failures never, and I mean never, just happen for no reason. So answering these fundamental questions of why and why now in a rational, structured manner is a mission-critical component of every forensic investigation of the failure of a geostructural system. I can't emphasize enough that geostructural failures never just happen. And this is important because it is not uncommon, for example, when a water main fails, that you see some government bureaucrat will go before the press and say, well, you know, these things happen. We don't know why. Uh, there's no reason. There's no answer. They just happen. Um, force majeure and all that. Uh, the reality is it's simply because the bureaucracy doesn't want to invest the time and resources into performing 
an adequate forensic investigation as to why that failure happened. Now, I've learned uh, in my professional career uh, that spans over 50 years now that conducting a geostructural forensic investigation is very extensive, multifaceted subject. There are both technical as well as professional and business components. And I've learned that these components are uniquely different from geotechnical or geostructural design and construction, as well as academic instruction and research. Uh, it takes a very particular skill set to perform a geostructural forensic investigation. So it's important to understand that somebody may be very proficient, very skilled, very experienced in design or construction, perhaps as an academician, but those skills do not necessarily translate into being able to perform a geostructural forensic investigation. And this, what, this is what motivated me to write and publish earlier this year this monograph on geostructural forensic investigations because of the unique aspects of geostructural forensic investigations. So this presentation is only a very brief introductory overview of what's contained in this monograph. And this monograph is really a synthesis and curation of my more than 50 years of professional practice as a civil engineer who has specialized in geotechnical foundation and related structural engineering. And I've been involved in my professional career in design capacity, uh, academic teaching and research, as well as forensic investigations. Well, the next topic I want to discuss uh, is basic concepts of geostructural failure. What constitutes failure in a broad and generic context is totally dependent on both the specific context as well as the person or organization or business entity that is viewing that context. So in order to discuss the forensic investigation of geotechnical failure, we first need to formally define what exactly constitutes failure for a geostructural system. Failure, which nowadays in civil engineering we refer to as the limit state in a geotechnical and structural context, is broadly defined as the loss of function, where the term function in this context is simply the role or purpose that a geostructure or a component of that geostructure is intended to provide or perform. This loss of function definition means that geostructural failure can take on two different forms. We can have an ultimate failure, the ultimate limit state, that typically involves a physical rupture of a solid material or its geotechnical equivalent of large-scale displacement and deformation of either the entire system or one or more system components. And usually as a result, we have a catastrophic collapse or all or part of the geostructural system. A serviceability failure, the serviceability limit state, involves the displacement, possibly deformation, of one or more components of a geostructural system of such a magnitude that the intended performance or function of the overall system is inhibited or even completely prevented even though the overall system is physically intact. Note that many geostructural systems, such as foundations and earth retaining structures, as I've noted previously, have a structural component in addition to the geotechnical component. So in those cases, we actually have four different states of failure or limit state to consider. We have the ultimate and serviceability limit state of both the geotechnical and structural components. Now, because the consequences of the ultimate limit state are typically much more critical than those of serviceability limit state uh, due to the collapsed nature of the ultimate limit state, uh, geotechnical and structural design philosophy and the codes we've developed for buildings, whatever, have historically focused on the ultimate limit state. Uh, it's also much easier to generalize and codify a design philosophy, the, the ultimate limit state, as opposed to the serviceability limit state. 
this is because the geostructural loss of function in the serviceability context is never uniquely defined, even for a given structure, as it's always dependent on the intended use of the structure, as well as the proverbial eye of the beholder. So it's important to, to recognize that, uh, especially for serviceability, both context and how that context is viewed by someone or some organization or business uh, really is quite important. Uh, an example is a warehouse can have many and varied uses and the tolerance of these uses to total and differential settlement of say the warehouse floor can be equally varied depending on the needs of the business entity utilizing the warehouse at a given point in time. Uh, some years ago, I was involved in investigating a warehouse used by an industrial company. It was an older building that had existed for decades, had been used to uh, uh, manufacture uh, electrical equipment, and the floor of the warehouse was rather uneven, but for the intended purpose was functioning just fine. However, when the building was, was converted to manufacture uh, precision parts, for uh, military applications, uh, the warehouse floor had to be, which previously was a slab on grade with uh, underlain by miscellaneous fill, uh, the, the floor slab had to be completely replaced and supported on deep foundations because the, the new function of the warehouse to, uh, in terms of manufacturing uh, required a much more level uh, floor. I'm emphasizing these points because uh, the ambiguity and divergence of opinion what constitutes a serviceability limit state can even occur with the ultimate limit state. Uh, because in, in some geostructural applications, I found that we've reached the ultimate limit state, but we've not had a collapse in the traditional sense. Uh, we can have very large scale displacements of soil slopes, earth retaining structures, building foundations that stop short of collapse, yet in any reasonable context, the, we've had a ultimate limit state, we've had a failure. And again, I'm emphasizing these points because the subjectivity of what constitutes the limit state, both serviceability and ultimate in geostructural applications is very relevant and important for geostructural forensic investigations. I have found that this function and eye of the beholder dependent subjectivity of what constitutes the serviceability and ultimate limit state in geostructural systems plays a very significant role in geostructural forensic investigations. As I've, in my experience, it's the rule rather than the exception that you have different forensic civil engineers will view the same data and come to radically different conclusions as to whether or not a serviceability or even ultimate limit state has even occurred. And this is a problem uh, because if there's litigation or arbitration, it's then left up to the court or arbitrators to decide whom to believe as to whether or not a failure uh, the limit state has been achieved So having defined what constitutes failure in a geostructural context, uh, we can state that the fundamental overarching objective in geostructural design is to prevent failure of the overall system. So design and prevent failure is always the focus of geostructural design. And the fundamental equation governing the ultimate limit state in both geotechnical and structural design is that the capacity or resistance has to exceed the demand or load. And the excess capacity represents what we call a safety margin. And we can incorporate safety into the overall geostructural system using uh, one of two approaches. The traditional approach, allowable stress design, uh, was alternatively called working stress design. And this uses safety factors in order to balance the two sides of this equation. So the modified version of this fundamental design equation becomes the allowable capacity, which is the actual capacity reduced by a safety factor greater than one, uh, equals or exceeds the actual demand. Uh, 
the alternative is the load and resistance factor design, LRFD. And when it first came out, it was called ultimate strength design. And this uses load factors on the demand side and resistance or reduction factors on the capacity side to balance the two sides of this fundamental design equation. So that the modified version of the fundamental design equation becomes the factor capacity, which is the actual capacity, perhaps reduced by a resistance factor that is less than one, equals or exceeds the factor demand, which is the actual demand times a load factor that is uh, typically greater than one. Well, as is, we know, uh, the global trend in civil engineering design practice uh, for many years now has been towards using LRFD in all geostructural design applications. And, and the logic for LRFD is presented as being more logical and theoretically defensible concept compared to the traditional allowable stress design for incorporating a desired safety margin based on a statistical probability of failure of a geostructural system. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the theoretical that we've, we've learned is that the theoretical development of the LRFD load and resistance factors is really easier said than done. So as a result, we've seen that it's become common to uh, what is euphemistically called calibrate these LRFD factors using the old fashioned allowable uh, stress design for which we have a long history of performance. Also, it's been recognized that applying LRFD to the geotechnical components of a geostructural system is much more problematic than for the structural components. For the simple reason that in a structural element, let's say a beam or a column, the sources of the demand, which are the live load, uh, wind load, seismic load perhaps, are independent of the capacity which comes from the material strength of the beam or column. On the other hand, in geotechnical components, the same soil appears on both the demand and capacity sides of the equation. So for example, if we have a soil slope, the density or uh, mass, the weight of the soil and the slope is both the driving force looking to destabilize the slope, so it's both the demand of the slope for slope stability, but also the, the weight of the soil, the mass of the soil, is what gives the soil its inherent shear strength. And it's the shear strength that is providing the capacity or resistance. So the same material is, is on both sides of the equation, and it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to logically uh, with an emphasis on the word logically apply LRFD load and resistance factors to the geotechnical components. Uh, the reason I'm emphasizing these design philosophies is that a much more significant issue in the context of this present uh, presentation is that geostructural forensic investigations usually require after the fact analysis of a geostructural system that failed. So we, we want to estimate what was the safety margin for different system components and for different failure modes of a given system component at the time of failure. My experience has been unequivocal that LRFD is really completely unsuitable for this mission critical task of geostructural forensic investigations, whereas allowable stress design readily provides the necessary framework for this. And that's because an actual safety factor is easily calculated as the actual capacity divided by the actual demand. So we simply make our best estimate of, you know, what was the load applied at the time of failure? Uh, what was the resistance that was available at the time of failure? And this gives us an estimate of the safety factor that existed at the time of failure. Well, in this next segment, I would like to talk about forensic investigations in a generic context. Forensic investigation of failure is very, very common uh, in the real world. Uh, 
It's performed in diverse industries and organizations for both tangible and intangible applications that range from product manufacturing uh, to product marketing to service industries, but always for the same reason. And that is very simply, if we don't learn from our mistakes, we tend to repeat those mistakes. So performance of forensic investigations by these diverse groups in industry and business is generally motivated by the overarching philosophy that it is better for the business in the long run to do what it has to to prevent reoccurrence of a failure by identifying and then rectifying the under, underlying cause of the failure as opposed to simply, and usually what happens repeatedly, only repairing the symptoms or outcome of the failure. This is a good mantra to follow, fix the problem and not the blame. Well, because failure forensic has been formally and extensively studied for many diverse business applications, it's useful to discuss a few basic concepts of these generic investigations before we look at forensic investigations specifically for geostructural systems. And this is to provide some baseline terminology and concepts uh, for us to use. Well, a number of analytical methods have for performing forensic investigations have been proposed over the years. And, and they have one thing in column, common, and that is to identify what is called the root cause of a failure. Uh, the method used to perform what is called a root cause analysis vary from the simplistic five whys method, where literally, if you ask why five times, you're supposed to magically wind up with the root cause of a failure. Uh, on the other hand, much more common is the more rigorous use of what is called the Ishikawa or fishbone diagram, and this allows rational consideration of multiple potential paths of some overall process that resulted in a problem. Uh, for example, in this case, manufacturing some product. So if you look, at, look into forensic investigations uh, in a general context, uh, you see this concept of fishbone diagrams comes up uh, all the time. I now want to discuss geostructural forensic investigations. This is a fairly lengthy segment, so I've broken it up into sub-segments uh, to better organize the material. Uh, we'll start off with an overview of the subject. So now that we've discussed uh, failure in a what constitutes failure in a geostructural context, as well as generic concepts. Uh, used for performing forensic investigations uh, in non-civil engineering applications. We can uh, combine this information and discuss forensic investigations for geostructural system failures. And this discussion draws heavily on my personal experiences with performing uh, geostructural forensic investigations for almost 50 years now. Well, to begin with, experience has shown that uh, geostructural forensic investigations are quite unique. That's That's been my unequivocal experience. And, and there are several aspects that set them apart from the type of generic forensic investigations performed for manufacturing and service industries. First of all, geostructural systems tend to be unique one-off combinations of a geostructure, its physical environment, and the site development history uh, where the structure is located, whereas processes in manufacturing and service industries tend to be repetitive in nature. I mean, if you have a machine that's making a certain product, that's it's a very classic example of a very repetitive uh, type of operation. Geostructural systems inherently are impacted by nature and natural events. Uh, in addition to human activities, whereas processes and manufacturing and service industries 
these tend to be solely human creations. The processes in manufacturing and service industries also tend to involve relatively short durations of time with a limited number of participants. So they tend to be easy to define, well-defined, uh, and that's straightforward to document completely when performing a forensic investigation, right? We, we know all the facts to assemble and put together. On the other hand, the geostructures are impacted by natural and human events that can involve you know, countless human participants and go back decades or even centuries in time, even to well before the structure existed. Uh, it's been my experience that things that happen at a site prior to building a geostructure can impact an eventual failure that happened to a geostructure that was constructed at that site. The bottom line is that all the potential factors that can impact a geostructural failure, I have found for practical purposes can be impossible to document completely. We just never know every single detail uh, that is potentially relevant. From a business or practical side of things, when a geostructural system fails, it's generally a very diverse group of interested parties. And these parties tend to have very competing business, financial, and legal interests. Uh, and this results in a legal process that, in my experience, drags on for many years. Uh, in the most extreme case that I've been involved in, I was involved in a construction claim involving rock removal, you know, the classical argument over what's rock versus soil. Uh, and I got involved literally 10 years after the claim was initially filed. Uh, now, while that's an extreme example, certainly it's been my experience that these cases drag on for the better part of a decade in most cases. In some geostructural failures, uh, government regulatory agencies can be involved, and, and this can happen especially with underground utility lines or in very high profile cases such as a building collapse. Um, and as a minimum, these government agencies have their own agenda, and quite honestly, in my opinion, they can also be biased. I, I have seen more than one instance where government agencies seem to have it in for one of the parties uh, in the investigation. And again, this was my personal opinion, but uh, you know, the people who make up government agencies, they're humans too, and, and humans tend to have biases. The bottom line is that forensic investigations of geostructural system failures tend to be performed primarily, in some cases solely, uh, to support a what I call a legal blame game. And this is really just for financial gain of one or more parties at the expense of one or more other parties. As the saying goes, it's all about the Benjamins. Uh, there is at best a limited interest in identifying actions that could be taken to prevent future failures of systems with similar characteristics. Uh, again, for an underground utility line, you know, you have, may have a failure that involves a certain type of pipe. Uh, there tend to be limited interest in saying, what can we do to prevent failures of other uh, situations where the same type of pipe exists? By comparison, in process and manufacturing or service industry has a failure. In most cases, there is a common collective corporate interest of everyone involved who expeditiously repair the process so that the failure doesn't happen again in the future. And the forensic investigation is performed with this in mind, right? Fix the problem, not the blame. Whereas in geostructural failures, the objective is almost always fix the blame. Whether or not we fix the problem, very often we don't care. Now, in manufacturing or service industries, there can be some element of a blame game. 
uh, in forensic investigations. It's what I call bureaucratic musical chairs. I mean, yeah, within an organization, you know, everybody wants to point a finger at somebody. But this is fairly tame in my experience and limited compared to really what I've found to be drawn out legal wars that typically happen when a geostructural system fails. The net result of all this is that geostructural forensic investigations really are unique in my experience. And if you're going to be a civil engineer who wants to get involved in performing such investigations, you need to be aware of several factors. Now, I, given this a lot of thought in preparing, you know, the monograph that I mentioned earlier in this presentation, I developed this mo monograph over several years. And uh, in thinking about it, I found that we can define five overarching themes that are important, uh, in fact, mission critical, in my opinion, to geostructural forensic investigations. And we can divide these five themes into two topical areas. Uh, we have technical themes, and we have those that apply to professional practice and business. Now, each of these topical areas and their themes uh, require some discussion. Because as I've said, I have found that these five themes are th mission critical for the successful performance of a geostructural forensic investigation and answering the fundamental questions, why and why now? Okay, why did this failure happen? Why did it happen now? So let's first talk about the technical themes. I found that the traditional generic forensic tools for performing a root cause analysis, such as the Fishbone or Ishikawa diagram, are really ill-suited for geostructural failures. And the reason is that, in general, I have found that it's not possible to identify a single unique root cause of a geostructural failure. There are usually multiple contributing factors, multiple root causes, if you will, and these act synergistically to cause a failure. Take away any one and the failure has, does not occur. And, and this is not unique to geostructures. This is actually something that's been found with other type of system failures, such as aircraft accidents. You know, if you've ever seen any of these TV shows about uh, aircraft accidents and their investigation, you'll find time and time again that they'll talk about the fact that it's not just one thing. It's a succession of mistakes or occurrences, and you put them all together and you have an aircraft accident. Eliminate any one of them and you don't have that accident. So it's very, very similar in geostructural failures in my experience. Another unique aspect of geostructural failures is that there's often a unique identifiable what I call trigger event. And this is something that occurs at the time of the failure, or perhaps shortly before a failure. And this trigger event destabilizes a system that had been stable. Now, perhaps only marginally, but it had been stable for some extended period of time prior to the failure. And I have found that this trigger event phenomenon is uh, very, very common with geostructural failures that involve underground utility lines. It's, it's very common in older uh, urban environments in older cities that we have uh, sewers and water mains that have been in the ground for well over 100 years, 150 years, things like that. And then all of a sudden one day they fail. And as I said at the beginning of this presentation, they, they don't just fail for no reason. There's always a reason. And in the utility failures that I've investigated in my career, I have found that there is very often a trigger event that uh, destabilizes a system that, you know, maybe was marginal to begin with, but it was still performing. But there was some trigger event that just pushed it over the edge and caused a failure. <clears throat> 
So in my experience, actually identifying a trigger event, if one exists, they don't, doesn't always exist, but when one exists, identifying a trigger event is as important, in fact, even more important than identifying a root cause or root causes, as very often this trigger event answers the why now question of a geostructural system failure. You know, answering the why question, this usually has multiple root causes, but answering the why now question, more times than not in my experience, there's a trigger event that answers the why now question. So what I found the most useful tool for performing a root cause analysis of a geostructural failure, and this is whether it's a uh, the ultimate limit state or serviceability limit state, no matter what type of failure it is, is to create a linear timeline. And this is simply you assemble all the available information of the site of a failure and the geostructure that failed in, in a temporal order. Now, when you construct this timeline initially, you should include all data. There is nothing that is too trivial uh, to not at least consider. And don't make any a priori judgment as to what is relevant to the failure event. Because beforehand, you really don't know what is or is not relevant. So when you assemble this timeline initially, every piece of information that you get from any source, whether it's an external source or something you, you, you discover yourself during the course of your forensic investigation, all of this information be, should be put into a uh, linear timeline. And this timeline should extend back in time to include all human activity at the site of the failure, even if this predates the construction of the geostructure that failed. Uh, and again, this is very, very important in older urban environments. Uh, you may have had prior structures that were built at a site. You may have had, you know, people came along and they filled in an old stream or river or an old pond or lake. Any human activity, and it could be hundreds of years before the geostructure that failed was even constructed, all of this information should be assembled in the timeline because you really don't know how far back in time you need to go. Now, once you've assembled this timeline, you then construct a causal mechanism, as I call it. Some people call it a causal chain because each one of these events you've identified is it's like a link in a chain. So you construct a causal mechanism or chain that in your opinion, as the forensic civil engineer, is the sequence of relevant events that led up to the failure. And as I said, usually you'll find that there are multiple root causes. There's relatively uncommon to find a single unique root cause of the failure. So from this causal mechanism, you define one or more root causes. And where relevant and one exists, you, you define the trigger event as well. Now, when you create this causal mechanism, uh, my experience has been that there are three overarching technical themes. I said a little while ago that there's five themes overall. Well, three of them are, are technical in nature. Uh, first one is to think broadly, think completely, and to think granularly. And I'm going to elaborate on each of these themes to explain the underlying reasons why I feel each of these is so critically, mission critical, important to every geostructural forensic investigation. So I liken this to a five-pointed star. We'll first talk about think broadly. Now, my experience has been that thinking broadly is the single most important theme that should be an undercurrent that runs through every geostructural forensic investigation. And we're going to see this in the case history that I present later on. Thinking broadly in the context of geostructural forensic investigations simply means that you, the forensic civil engineer, approach each and every forensic investigation with a completely open mind, 
as to what might be the relevant technical components of a failure causal mechanism. The hardest thing that we as professional civil engineers have to overcome is confirmation bias. And this means because of our education, our professional interests, our professional experience, we tend to become very specialized in, in a certain aspect of civil engineering. And this is what we mean by confirmation bias. It's not bad inherently, it just is, is just part of being an expert in a particular technical area. So you want to avoid confirmation bias and always look beyond your area of professional specialization and expertise when you look at the physical evidence, during the, at least during the initial stages of a forensic investigation. Again, we're going to see this in the case history later on. And I found it's especially important to keep in mind these so-called gray areas or transitional gaps between areas of specialization that tend to be uh, a technological no man's land, as was uh, a term used by the late professor Sven Hansbo, uh, wrote a very interesting opinion piece in Ground Engineering Magazine more than 40 years ago. And uh, even then, even more than 40 years ago, uh, Professor Hansbo was lamenting the specialization in civil engineering education and professional practice. And of course, this has only become more so in the decades since. By gray areas or transitional gaps, these are subjects that fall through the gaps between areas of specialization. Uh, for example, between geotechnical engineering and structural engineering, very often soil structure interaction tends to fall through the gap. So we want to take particular care to watch out for those sorts of things. And again, this is going to be something that we'll see in the case history later on in this presentation. The next theme is to think completely. Now, in the context of geostructural forensic investigations, thinking completely is simply the recognition that for the analyses that we perform for forensic investigations, you remember earlier I said that it's, it's quite typical that we'll perform back analyses uh, for safety factors of different components of a geostructural system, different failure modes. So, for example, for retaining wall, you might look at, well, what was the safety factor in sliding, overturning, bearing capacity, etc. When you perform these back analyses or after the fact analyses, it's been my experience that it is not in general adequate to simply apply routine design or code methods in reverse to calculate the safety margin. So I, I, it's important to understand that forensic analyses are not simply design practice in reverse. And the simple reason is that the methods that we use in routine design or incorporated into various codes reflect the state of practice. And these methods have been chosen to strike a balance between accuracy and ease of use. And in my experience, the emphasis is on ease of use at the expense of accuracy. Now, my experience has been that as a rule, you need to use analytical methods that reflect the state of knowledge. Uh, some people call it the state of art uh, in order to adequately assess the actual geostructural behavioral mechanisms that occur in a failure situation, as opposed to the simplistic and sometimes totally incorrect mechanisms that are part of normal design and code methods. And this is best illustrated using the common example of a retaining wall collapse, uh, such as the one that I showed you at the outset uh, of this presentation. So again, here is our rather massive gravity retaining wall. It was built in the early years of the 20th century, the upper west side of borough of Manhattan in New York City. And in the early years of the 21st century, as you could see, it suffered a partial collapse failure. Uh, now, this is a very high profile failure, as you could see, 
the failure went over uh, part of Riverside Drive and uh, Henry Hudson Parkway. So it closed off two major roadways. Uh, this is the Hudson River, by the way. This view is looking north. So, uh, because this is a very high profile failure, the New York City Building Department commissioned a board of inquiry to study this objectively and issued a report, as you can see, about uh, two years after the failure. So, uh, this failure is well documented in the public record. This report can be easily found online. So, there's uh, all the information I'm talking about is in the public domain. Well, this wall was about 75 feet, roughly 23 meters high, and about 24 feet, roughly 8 meters wide at its base. Uh, and this is a base width to height ratio of only about 0.3 or a third. So on the, on the low side, uh, my experience is uh, from having taught <laughs> uh, geotechnical and foundation engineering for over 30 years that, uh, you know, just from uh, creating homework problems to design a gravity retaining wall that you, you need a B over H ratio greater certainly than three or a third to have a stable system under gravity loading. Now, in routine design practice or in building codes, we would apply this uh, hydrostatic or triangular distribution of lateral earth pressures, uh, preferably using a solution from Coulomb earth pressure theory, uh, perhaps an exact method. Uh, no, Rankin's method is not correct here, despite what a lot of people might think, despite what some codes may say. Uh, Rankin's method is simply incorrect here. I won't get into that. Um, you could read my various publications as to why uh, Rankin's method is simply incorrect to use here. But in any event, uh, the routine practice in codes would also assume that this wall would behave in a rigid monolithic manner. So if we're looking at sliding, uh, we're looking at overturning, we're looking at bearing capacity, we're looking at bearing stresses. The assumption would be that this 75 foot high mass of material would move as a rigid body. As I said, very common, very typical assumptions that I've shown you here. However, the actual wall exhibited very substantial bulging, especially at the mid-height. And by substantial, I'm talking about several feet. Uh, really can't be seen too well in this photo, but uh, there is a very substantial uh, mid-height bulge. And this photo was taken less than a month prior to the failure. Uh, as I said, several feet relative to the forensic investigation indicated this bulging was several feet relative to the original geometry of the wall. Well, there's no way that this is going to explain that bulging for two reasons. So modeling this actual behavior, first of all, you have to use arching theory for lateral earth pressures, not the traditional hydrostatic earth pressure distribution. Because arching theory, uh, which we know from research is simply more correct, uh, you will get a peak lateral earth pressure, not here at the bottom, uh, at the base, but somewhere maybe at mid-height, a little bit lower than mid-height. Also, you need to allow for the semi-rigid segmental wall behavior. Right? This, this wall was not a monolith of poured in place Portland cement concrete, reinforced concrete, or even unreinforced concrete. It was an assemblage of pieces of stone. And uh, although these blocks were mortared at the face, they were not mortared internally. Allowing for this semi-rigid segmental wall behavior is also essential for not only forecasting this bulging of the wall, but also the fact when the wall failed, it was not the entire wall. It was an upper portion, a substantial upper portion of the wall failed, and part of the original wall was left intact down here. So a very classic example of how 
if you applied traditional design methods and methods you find in various codes in reverse, there is no way you would be able to forecast what actually occurred. But if you use more realistic analytical methods, more realistic assumptions about the segmental nature or the fact that many walls that we consider to be quote unquote rigid are not in fact rigid, they are uh, semi-rigid and deformable. That's the only way you could explain how and why this wall behaved up to the point of failure and at the time of failure. The third of five themes and the last one of a technical nature is to think granularly. And in the context of geostructural forensic investigations, thinking granularly is the recognition that no detail is too small or trivial to be considered explicitly. And absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, should ever be taken for granted without independent verification to the extent practical or possible by you, the forensic civil engineer. And this includes things we take for granted, very basic things like specific gravity of the soil particle solids or soil identifications that may have been made by others. And again, I think the best way to illustrate the point I'm trying to make here is to use an actual example from geostructural forensic practice. And this was actually the very first forensic investigation I was involved in in my career in the, uh, uh, the early 1970s. Well, this was a high school gymnasium building. It was a single story building, no below ground space, pre-engineered steel rigid frame construction. Uh, the interior floor was simply slab on grade. Uh, the rigid frame columns along the sides of the building in the longitudinal direction were supported on thickened edges of the floor slab. So the thickened edges of the floor slab basically acted as uh, continuous footings for the columns for this building. The subsurface investigation that was performed for the original designers indicated a stratum of fill, uh, the lower portion of which uh, consisted of pure anthracite coal fragments. Uh, this was an anthracite coal country in the uh, eastern part of the United States. Uh, also indicated that uh, natural soil stratum, several tens of feet thick, primarily sand and gravel, although on part of the site there was a stratum that was described as being silt. And this was all underlain by sedimentary rock, shale, and sandstone with anthracite coal seams. Well, two things turned out to be important. One was the identification of silt. And I should point out that the borings were done without independent geotechnical inspection. So the entire project was designed based on what we call drillers logs, meaning that the people who drilled the borings identified the materials they encountered, wrote them down on boring logs, and these were the, the only uh, soil descriptions that were used to design this structure and its foundations. And another important part was this anthracite coal fragments that were encountered within the fill stratum. And if you're not familiar with this, I'm highlighting this because anthracite coal has a specific gravity of solids of the order of about 1.5. This is per the U.S. Geological Survey. Well, in reality, the so-called silt stratum turned out to be normally consolidated organic clay that had accumulated within a pond that had been filled in eventually, uh, constructed due to human activity in the area, mining and processing coal. And the original fill was replaced by compacted sand and gravel. And this was because the owner found that they could actually make more money by removing the anthracite coal fragments, selling them at a profit, and that more than paid for replacing the fill with compacted sand and gravel, which uh, 
the original design engineers for the building felt, well, this is going to be a better foundation stratum for the shallow foundations, the slab on grade. Well, of course, the silicious sand and gravel that was used uh, as the replacement fill had a specific gravity of solids about 2.7, which is almost twice that for the anthracite that was removed. Well, what happened after the fact we could see is pretty predictable. Uh, because of the change in unit weight of the fill stratum, even though the thickness of the fill did not change, the unit weight was almost double. So the vertical stress increased due to the weight from the fill replacement plus the building loads on the organic clay stratum caused this differential settlement in the form of a rigid body rotation uh, of the overall building. And, and this was significant because the main component of this building was a basketball court that was aligned in the longitudinal direction in, in this direction of the building. Uh, interestingly, the the owner of the building actually chose to live with this. Now, the building no longer exists, but it existed for several decades and was used. And I was told that uh, whenever they would have high school basketball league games, they had, there was a special rule for games played in this building where the teams had to change sides every few minutes. And that was so simply because they didn't want to have one team always running uphill uh, to the, the basket. We can laugh about this after the fact, but the fact still remains that um, uh, this was a serviceability uh, failure uh, due to not properly identifying uh, the materials that were involved at the site, relying on drillers logs, which is something you should never do, and not taking into account the specific gravity of the existing fill versus the replacement fill. Very basic concepts. So my suggestion is heed the advice of Sherlock Holmes. Observe the trifles. There is nothing that is ever too trivial, uh, too simple to consider during the course of a geostructural forensic investigation. This now brings us to the professional practice and business side of things. And with, re with respect to the unique professional practice business aspects of geostructural forensic investigation, my experience has shown that there are two overarching themes. So I said there were five themes overall. We've talked about the three technical themes. We're now going to talk about the two professional practice and business themes. One is to think independently and the other is to think honestly. And again, as with the three technical themes that I just finished discussing, each of these two themes require some elaboration to explain my reasoning why I feel these are mission critical important in every geostructural forensic investigation. Well, think independently. What do we mean by that? In the context of geostructural forensic investigations, thinking independently means that the forensic civil engineer should always perform their own independent forensic investigation. Now, reasonably, it's fine to use unique factual information that's developed by others, such as government agencies, during the course of their investigations. Uh, in my experience, uh, when you have very high profile failures, very often an underground utility line, it may be a building collapse. For legal reasons, a government organization may have control of that site and they may perform certain testing of materials, destructive testing or whatever, that can't be replicated by others. So it's, in my experience, it's certainly acceptable to use factual information like this. 
Uh, but you have to use this factual information to develop, always develop, I emphasize always, your own causal mechanism, root causes and trigger event if, if one uh, exists. And more than ever, I found this can be challenging because uh, forensic civil engineers are often engaged relatively late in the game these days. And by late in the game, I'm talking months or even years after a failure event occurs. Uh, when I first started doing forensic investigations decades ago, the forensic civil engineer used to be contacted very often days or weeks after a failure occurred. Now it tends to be months or years later. And it makes a big difference in things in a lot of ways. So this means that independent site investigation is impossible. The, the, the failure site has long since been uh, repaired, covered over, whatever. Uh, the overall scope of your forensic investigation may be limited by your client uh, as to what the client is looking for, what the client is willing to pay for. Very important, the parties to the failure, which are the litigants in most cases, have already developed their own opinions as to failure causation and the ever important blame. Uh, they may not be engineers, but that doesn't prevent them from, in their own mind, deciding what caused the failure and who's to blame for it. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, blame is the name of the game in geostructural failures. Uh, somebody's looking to collect money from somebody else. That's, that's, that's really the heart of most of these cases. In addition, the litigation is often well advanced, and these litig litigants' opinions, right or wrong, good or bad, have already been documented or otherwise reflected in various legal proceedings and filings. So we're talking about legal things such as discovery, uh, examination before trials, which are colloquially called depositions, um, perhaps uh, uh, various legal filings. And it's, it's impossible, uh, very difficult at best, or impossible in many cases, to go back and correct these legal processes that have already occurred. Now, in extreme cases, and this has happened to me not often, but it's happened a time or two, uh, the forensic civil engineer may be sought out merely to professionally rubber stamp some failure causation that's assumed or imagined by others. I, I literally, one case comes to mind, a state highway department who I will not name, contacted me and said, look, we've done our investigation. This is our opinion on what caused the failure. We need somebody with your academic credentials and all the letters after your name to go to court and say this is what caused the failure. And they were blunt about it. At the end of the day, it becomes a professional and judgment of a licensed professional engineer whether or not you want to get involved in assignments. Um, my suggestion is, is to clearly understand up front what the specific constraints of a potential geostructural forensic assignment are, and then you make your own professional decision whether or not you want to get involved. Nobody can make that decision for you. Well, that brings us to the last of our points on the five-point star. Uh, think honestly. Now, in the context of geostructural forensic investigations, thinking honestly is the recognition of the fact that it is not your job or ethical duty to be an advocate for your client. Uh, so you don't have to blindly accept your client's opinions unless you want to, it's up to you, as to failure causation, root causes, etc., without performing an honest, independent forensic investigation of your own and forming your own opinions, especially and primarily with respect to a causal mechanism, uh, root causes, if, and if there is one, a trigger event. As I said, uh, 
experiences that the various parties who are usually litigants to a failure generally form their opinions about failure causation and fault and legal liability based on a very selective cherry picking of the facts that support their opinions. Uh, it's very easy to state an opinion if you only look at the facts that are uh, uh, in your favor. Uh, surprisingly and amazingly in some cases I found these facts are off these cherry pick facts are combined with assumptions or hypotheses that that violate basic science and I'm not exaggerating here I, I have seen very slick professional uh, animations uh, explaining why something happened with a utility line underground utility line failure and they literally show water flowing uphill uh, how people can do this with a straight face and how a professional engineer in this case signed off on it, I, I can't begin to imagine. Bottom line is facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. And, and that's really something to always, always keep in mind in my opinion. Okay, so we've gone through the some preliminary material, and that now brings us to the case history that I would like to cover in some detail. And uh, this is a fairly uh, lengthy part of the presentation. So again, I have broken up the case history into several uh, components, and also these components. Uh, or subcomponents are typically the steps you would go through to perform a geostructural investigation. As you'll see, this case history is technically very modest in terms of the physical damage that occurred and the geotechnical and structural behavioral mechanisms that are involved are quite basic and, and simple, although these mechanisms did interact in a rather complex uh, soil structure interaction manner. However, I chose this case history intentionally for several broader purposes uh, that fit the intentions or goals of this presentation. First of all, this case history illustrates how a just structural forensic investigation that at first seems very simple and straightforward uh, can turn out to be surprisingly complex in terms of the soil structure interaction that is involved, as well as the causal mechanism of the failures that were observed. This case history also illustrates the mission critical importance of what my experience has shown is the single most important theme of the five themes I spoke about earlier for geostructural forensic investigations, and that is the necessity for thinking broadly. And in this case, even in the most mundane of geostructural forensic investigations. And as a result, you need to perform a methodical phased forensic investigation, keeping an open mind, uh, putting aside any confirmation bias that you may have as a result of your specialization, and just use the factual information as it is acquired. Specifically in this case, as you'll see, is what, what first appeared to be a structural issue. And what's interesting is actually there had been a prior forensic investigation and structural repairs that were performed by others. Um, so there were all indications were that it was a structural issue, and that's how it was presented to me when I was first contacted by the client. However, as you'll see, it turned out to be geotechnical in its origin. You'll also see, because there had been a prior forensic investigation and repairs, the short-sightedness and waste of money of applying what I call a Band-Aid solution to the symptoms of a problem without making an effort to determine the root cause of the problem. Well, let me first start with an overview of this case history. I did this uh, investigation back in 1990, and it involves a commercial building uh, in the suburbs uh, of New York City, 
Uh, the age of the building was unknown. The client, who was also the owner of the building, was either unable or unwilling to provide any information as to the age of the building. I couldn't find any information about the age of the building. But the design details that were used suggested to me that it was built in the early 20th century. If I had to guess, I would say 1920s. And as you can see, the building fronted on a major street. The owner and primary occupant of the building, who was my client, was concerned about chronic ongoing outward lean of the brick front of the building. And as we'll see, it's this area up here. Especially since remedial work to arrest this or an attempt to arrest this horizontal displacement and deformation of the wall had already been performed by others, uh, yet the problem continued. And uh, again, the owner and primary occupant of the building was also my client for this investigation, was either unable or unwilling to tell me when this remedial work had been done. Uh, any of the details of it, who was involved with the work. But as you'll see, uh, their indications were that this work had been done not too long before uh, the March-April 1990 time frame when I was involved in this uh, project. Here's a view from street level, and by siding along the face of the building, you can see a bit of a, an outward lean here. This outward lean was several inches. I'll show you more details as we get into this. But it was certainly noticeable from the street. And this was the only external indication that work had been done to try to alleviate this outward lean of the wall. As you'll see, there are several steel plates like this. And although the plate is rusted, of course, it doesn't take untreated steel or unpainted steel too long to rust, but you'll notice there's no streaks or anything coming down. So this suggested to me that these repairs had not been done uh, too much earlier than the March-April 1990 time frame when I was involved with this building. So a geostructural forensic investigation was commissioned. Uh, I was the principal engineer involved with this, uh, and the goal was to first and foremost identify the cause of the ongoing wall problem, because clearly these repairs that had been done by others had not arrested the problem. Well, here's a, a simple plan view of the building. The street side where the horizontal displacement and deformation is noticed is here. As you can see, the building is about 100 by 125 feet in plan, roughly 30 by 38 meters. There are two floor levels near the front, one floor level near the rear, uh, with a ramp upwards. At the time that I investigated the building, uh, all the uses of the building were for uh, automotive repair purposes. This is a cross-section or elevation view from west to east. Again, this is the street side. This is the area where the wall was displacing uh, horizontally. And you could see why there were two floors. Basically, the building was built into a hillside. So, there, so it was, the building was stepped into the hillside. There was a, the property line was just a few feet beyond the rear wall of the building. And there was a very steep, roughly one-on-one -on -one, uh, soil slope upward from the rear wall of the building. There were abundant rock outcrops. Uh, based on that, plus my general knowledge of the geology of the area, this was a suburb north of New York City. Uh, rock is, in general, at or close to the surface in many areas. And as we'll see, there were also abundant vegetation in the form of trees of various size here. Well, let me now get into the forensic investigation that was performed. Because the problems that were conveyed to me by the building owner 
were on the phone uh, in the initial contacts uh, were entirely structural in nature. The client described the outward lean of the face of the building, the fact that there had been some prior attempts, uh, structural attempts to control this. Uh, the initial phase of the investigation focused on the structural details of the building, primarily the internal details of the building. So using this uh, simple plan view as a guide, first we'll start with the roof and work our way down into the building. Uh, the roof was bow shaped. It consisted of a built up membrane, very typical built up membrane over timber plank decking. Uh, in my experience in this area, timber plank decking for roofs was very common uh, up until plywood started to be used in the latter decades of the 20th century. Uh, these rectangles you see here, these used to be skylights, but at the time of the investigation in 1990, these had been covered over by plywood. These were just vents in the roof. So you could see that the bow shape was in a roughly north to south direction. And again, here's the street side, and this is, this is the front wall that was displacing and deforming in a horizontal fashion. The roof support consisted of timber bowstring trusses, and this was part of why I dated this to perhaps the 1920s time frame. Uh, my experience uh, with construction, uh, commercial and industrial construction in this area, is that uh, this was a very typical uh, design detail for buildings where they wanted a lot of open space, you know, for example, like an automotive garage or something like that, some manufacturing facility where they wanted a lot of open floor space. So there were um, three trusses uh, running in the north-south direction here. And as you could see, the trusses were supported on pilasters that were integrated with the north and south exterior walls. So that meant that the north and south exterior walls were load-bearing walls. And this is an interior photo taken of the northeast corner of the second floor, just to give you a typical view of the exterior wall. The exterior walls were all common red brick. On the inside, they had been painted and the detail of the wall is for the parts of the wall that were below ground, the wall was substantially thicker than the extensions above ground. So this thicker part here is below ground and this thinner part here is above ground. It appeared that to me that uh, the interior walls uh, that were in contact with the ground had been parged a number of times over the years, presumably to control moisture water infiltration and as you could see the interiors had simply been painted as well. Continuing our, our way down to the second floor, uh, in the rear there was only one floor level and it's assumed to be slab on grade. Uh, there was no investigation to dig through the floor, as you'll see, the after the initial structural investigation, things turned to a geotechnical focus. So it was it didn't it, I did not deem it relevant to uh, break open the floor and see what was supporting it. That didn't seem to be an issue. Again, the important thing here is when you, in my opinion, when you perform these investigations, is, is to do things in a phased manner. Don't just rush in and start doing, you know, ripping up things, digging holes everywhere. Is, is just try to progress in a rational manner. In this case, we started with the structural elements because all the indications we had from the building owner uh, and client were that things were structural, the problems were structural in nature. But you, you approach things in a phased manner and as you discover new data, new findings, uh, you simply adjust your investigation accordingly. As I said, the front of the building had two floor levels. And for the front of the building that 
had two floor levels. Uh, there were steel beams that ran in an east-west direction. And uh, as you can see on the west end here, the beams rested on the exterior wall of the building. All right, so the beams rested on the exterior wall of the building. Uh, by the way, this wall that's light colored, th this is brick. It just had been uh, covered over in a decorative fashion on that lower level. So these beams that carry the second floor over the first floor in the front of the building were supported on the exterior wall, uh, which meant that the front exterior wall of the building was load, also load-bearing in nature. And that was significant because, again, this was the side of the building where there was several inches of horizontal displacement and deformation of the upper part of the wall here. So this heightened our concern because uh, this wall that was displacing was also a load-bearing wall. Look at the second floor from a cross-sectional perspective. Again, this exterior wall facing the street uh, where we have the horizontal displacement was load bearing in nature. And here are the, the beams that carry the second floor over the first floor extension. And again, the concern here was that this load bearing wall was uh, considerably out of plumb by several inches. Well, continuing the interior structural inspection, uh, this hand-drawn sketch were the field notes done by a structural engineer that worked with me uh, on this. Uh, this is just the floor beams that I pointed out previously. And very early on, what caught our eye were these knee braces, uh, structural knee braces in the front of the building. And this is a close-up sketch uh, that was made during the forensic investigation. This is the floor, the steel floor beam carrying the second floor over the first floor. This is a photo I took showing the knee braces that had been constructed. I mean, these were done... It must have taken some effort and some cost to do this. And again, these looked fairly new. Obviously, they had been freshly painted. So I, I don't think this work had been done too much earlier than the March, April 1990 time frame when I was involved with the structure. So the purpose of these knee braces, as best as we could deduce, was here you see the exterior wall. And Although it doesn't show up that clearly in the photo, uh, this was out of plumb by several inches. So this was the wall that was leaning outward towards the street. And clearly the intent of these braces was to structurally tie the exterior wall to the braces, which themselves were framed into the, these floor beams, these 36 inch floor beams. And you can see there are steel angles that connect to threaded rods that connect to a plate in the front of the building. So these plates, this is the plate you see here on the exterior face of the wall. So the whole idea was to try to tie this wall back structurally to these knee braces that were framed into these floor beams. And there were five of these knee braces. They were spaced in a unequal spacing across the face of the building. And again, in this direction, the building is uh, about, a, about 125 feet long, roughly 38 meters. How these, uh, the spacing was chosen, uh, no idea. And again, the building owner and the client for my forensic investigation was either 
unable or unwilling to provide any details at all as to who had done this work and when. Uh, so we were not able to talk to uh, the people who had done this work to try to find out what was their logic or reasoning for placing these braces where they did. But there were five of them spread out across the face of the building, as I said, over, over this roughly 125 foot face. So we've discussed these knee braces at the front of the, of the second floor. Let's continue on with our structural inspection. Here are the roof trusses I noted previously. The, again, these are timber bowstring roof trusses running, three of them running in a north-south direction. And we're looking at a east-west cross section here. On top of the roof trusses, spanning from the front to the rear of the building, are three by eight timber rafters. And in the front of the building, they are bearing on the exterior wall, which was already load bearing in nature from the second floor beams. Uh, but now we have the added load from the timber rafters. And this was troubling uh, because this is where the wall was most out of plumb by several inches. So there's a real concern that uh, these rafters could literally uh, lose their support from the front wall. Working our way to the rear of the building, here's a photo taken of the rear wall. Again, all four exterior walls of this building were just common red brick. We see that the roof rafters are simply resting on a ledge that was constructed in the brick wall. And uh, of note, and certainly troubling to us, was the fact that the ends of these rafters on the rear wall were all twisted. Uh, clearly, there was something going on here that required some additional investigation. But I'll first point out that, of course, this rear wall was a load-bearing wall. So we've now identified the fact that all four exterior walls of this building were load-bearing in nature. And, and this is very important when you are doing a forensic investigation of a building that is derives its support in whole or in part from load-bearing walls. Uh, it's very important to identify which walls are load-bearing in nature because any problems with those walls carries much more significant consequence in terms of a potential collapse of the building. I'll also point out the timber plank roof decking on which the built up membrane roof was placed. We see the very typical uh, timber plank roof decking. As I said, uh, this was the typical type of roof decking you would see in smaller commercial industrial buildings as well as residential housing uh, in the area of this case history. Uh, up until plywood started to become common in the latter decades of the 20th century. And of course, as we know, that since has transitioned in a lot of cases to using uh, OSB oriented strand board. Well, as I said, the, the twist at the end of these uh, roof rafters and the rear wall of the building uh, was of concern, so we took a closer look at the uh, rear wall of the building. And this is just a sketch that was made at the time of the structural inspection uh, that we did initially. And we were surprised to find that the rear wall of the building was leaning towards the street as well. And the rear wall of the building was out of plumb also by several inches. So uh, this was a surprise uh, because it, it had not been commented on by the owner or anything like that. And clearly this was contributing to the twist at the end of the roof rafters that I pointed out previously. We also noted significant water infiltration coming through the rear wall. There was a very typical staining and things like that that we see from water infiltration. Well, the initial structural inspection of the building, and again, 
I can't emphasize too much the importance of uh, 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 the efficiency of doing a phased forensic investigation. You don't just dump, jump into doing a whole bunch of things. And in this case, since the problem that was presented to us by the building owner and client was structural in nature, we initially began with a detailed structural inspection. But this structural inspection clearly indicated that further investigation was required to determine the causes of the inward horizontal displacement of the rear wall of the building and the water infiltration through the rear wall of the building. Both of these were completely unexpected findings and they, they clearly suggested an external causation from the upward sloping area behind the building. So we, we shifted the focus of the inspection uh, from the inside structural details to a more detailed exterior inspection with a geotechnical focus because it was pretty clear that there was something pushing on this building from the outside. So this is the next phase of the forensic investigation that I'd like to talk about. And again, I'll just use the simple uh, plan view and uh, cross-section elevation view that I've used previously. Now the focus shifted to the rear wall of the building that we had discovered was also displacing several inches inward. So the magnitude of the horizontal displacement here was, was of the same order of magnitude that we observed in the front wall of the building. And we also wanted to investigate what was the source of the groundwater that was infiltrating through the wall of the building. Well, this is a photo I took in April 1990 from the roof of the building. There was a parapet around the entire roof. Uh, and here you can see the, the bubble shape to the roof, very typical of this bow shaped type roof design, the built up membrane, the covered over skylights. So there was a brick parapet of varying height, no more than a couple feet high. Um, not the standard code height one would expect nowadays for a wall, but uh, there's a parapet around the building. And, and this was just uh, vitrified clay capping on top of the brick wall. So this is a photo from the southeast corner of the building looking from south to north. And photo from the other end looking from north to south. And as you can see, the ground is up and over the parapet and, and washing over onto the roof of the building. Uh, there are trees, uh, some of them of surprising diameter or caliper as they're technically called. Uh, growing right up against the rear wall of the building. And again, the property line is just a few feet from the rear wall of the building. So the property line is, is perhaps somewhere in here. I'll just invert this upper photo just so you can kind of get a perspective of, uh, it prov provides the same perspective looking to the roof to the left and the slope to the right. Well, clearly the, the attention focused on what was going on with this rather steep slope up behind the rear wall of the building. Uh, this is an aerial photo of the building. Actually, the, the aerial photo was taken some year. It's, it's later than 1990, but it does depict what the roof of the building looked like at the time of the forensic investigation uh, in 1990. And again, here's the rear wall of the building that we had discovered was displacing inward. And this is the front wall, of course, of the building that was displacing outward towards the street. Also water infiltration through this wall. And again, the property line was just a few feet from the rear wall of the building. So I'm going to show you a sequence of photos I took standing on the ground looking up towards the east upslope and well what can you say wow <laughs> uh, certainly I was shocked when I, I saw this uh, a little bit of everything here 
Obviously, a very steep slope. We see parts of a canter fort retaining wall here. This wall is constructed of concrete masonry unit, concrete block, sometimes called colloquially cinder block. We see part of the wall standing, wall missing portions of the block wall here. Uh, a lot of small caliper trees. Again, caliper is simply the technical term used for measuring the diameter of trees. Uh, a lot of small caliper trees indicating that these are fairly young trees. Steel drums, uh, steel parts of steel whatever uh, equipment all over the slope. Uh, evidence of a fire uh, of unknown origin on the slope. Continuing along, another photo, working our way here from south to north. A few very large trees indicating, obviously, these are much older trees, pieces of broken retaining wall. Again, more evidence of a fire. More evidence of broken retaining wall. And finally, the north end of the wall uh, that's still standing, although obviously it is, it's structurally uh, broken and in an imminent state of collapse. Uh, if I put all these photos together in a montage to kind of give you a view upslope, uh, the photos match up reasonably well. We can, we can get a view again. This is a distance of roughly about 125 feet, about 40 meters or so in round numbers. So we, we see that there's, here's the two ends of the retaining wall, counterfort retaining wall that are still standing. Large part of the wall has failed. Debris from the wall strewn about the slope. Uh, evidence of at least two fires, one here, one here. Who knows what the origin of the fires were. Uh, if I had a guess, I rather doubt that they were natural in origin. Uh, my guess would be that these were started by people. Um, all sorts of anthropogenic debris all over the slope. Well, let's take a closer look at this upslope area. And clearly, this, this, is, this was a complete surprise, obviously. The building owner and tenant, uh, primary tenant, and was also my client, uh, did not give any indication of, of, of this sort of uh, mayhem uh, behind the building. So here's a more complete aerial photo. Uh, again, this is photos from somewhat later than 1990, but is quite representative of the conditions that existed in 1990. And again, here's the street, the front of the building. This is where the wall was leaning outward that started this whole investigation. And here's the rear wall where we found was leaning inward as well. So clearly, the source of a lot of this debris was a failed counterfort retaining wall. And the the length of the failed area was about 100 feet, 30 meters long. And clearly, as a result of this failure, this sent a wall of debris, broken parts of the wall, soil backfill behind the wall, uh, material that had been stored on the behind the wall, uh, steel drums, steel parts of various uh, pieces of equipment that are hard to identify. Uh, large pieces of, of tree trunks, perhaps cut as firewood, things like that. So this was the end of the forensic investigation that uh, really the very important outcome was finding out that uh, the rear wall of the building had moved inward and that there had been this failed wall that sent a lot of debris down against the rear wall of the building. Having discussed the forensic investigation uh, that was performed,
I want to go through the causal mechanism that I came up with based on the findings of this investigation. Again, here's the property line a few feet from the rear wall of the building. And again, this is the street side of the building and the front of the building is where the horizontal displacement of the building components was first noted by the building owner and occupant. So the property to the east of the property line was residential property, is residential property still in the present. Uh, an older single family house, if I had to guess, probably dated to very early in the 20th century. And again, there was a one on roughly a one on one slope from the rear wall of the building eastward. And apparently at some time in the past, the owner of the residential property had a counterfort retaining wall constructed. I can only speculate that this was to provide a fairly level backyard area for at least part of the property. And it was clear from the debris that was found on the slope that uh, all sorts of material was stored in this area. Uh, there were steel drums, other steel parts from some sort of uh, machinery or equipment, um, a lot of sawn tree trunks, presumably for future use as firewood. It was approximately 35 feet, 10 meters from the rear wall of the building to the line of this retaining wall at the closest point. And at some point in the past, uh, roughly 100 feet, 30 meters of this retaining wall, so a very substantial part of it, uh, failed. Uh, suffered a catastrophic collapse type of failure. And as a result, a avalanche of debris, uh, mixed debris, everything from parts of the retaining wall to retained soil to the anthropogenic materials that were stored in the backyard area here uh, came down the slope and over time rested against the rear wall of the building. So I now want to go through a sequence of events uh, of the causal mechanism, if you will, links in the causal chain as I envisage them based on the factual information that I observed. And uh, th this dash box is just the original outline of the building at the roof level. And this is the street side where the horizontal displacement of the wall, uh, the front wall of the building was first noted. And again, I'll be using this idealized west to east cross section through the building, the street side property line slope up to the residential property. The first element in the causal mechanism was that debris from the failed retaining wall moved down slope to the rear wall of the building. And in the extreme, you could see this is actually a piece of that retaining wall, right? It was just concrete block, unreinforced as best as I could tell. And in extreme cases, pieces of this block came down the entire roughly 35 feet, 10 meters down the slope to rest against the parapet of the building. Again, this is just a vitrified clay capping on top of the rear wall, on top of the parapet. Looking at an aerial photo of this first step in the causal mechanism, we have the failed counterfort retaining wall sending debris against the rear wall of the building. As a result of this material moving downslope against the rear wall of the building, uh, 
we have an earth force from the accumulated slope debris push the rear wall, building wall inward and this is just an idealization of the dis uh, displaced building outline at the ro roof level and by siding along the parapet wall you, you can actually see by fitting a straight line here that there were several inches of horizontal displacement at the parapet level and again this was noticed in the interior inspection this wall was out of plumb by several inches at the top of the wall where the roof rafters rested on a shelf in the brick wall and again looking at the second step in an aerial photo we see the earth force pushing the rear wall inward the next step in the causal mechanism is that we had also had horizontal displacement of the parapets on the north and south walls i had not noted this previously but took aerial photo uh, not aerial photos but I took photos of the parapets uh, this is the north wall the the south wall is difficult to see because there was a rather mature tree growing right up against the wall uh, there is one here as well but it's still a little bit easier to see but again by fitting a straight line you could see that at the parapet level the north and south walls actually bowed outward again looking at this superimposed on the aerial photo as the next step in the causal mechanism the horizontal displacement of the rear wall, wall of the building also created uh, axial displacements and forces within the roof rafters the roof rafters i believe acted as a fairly stiff structural diaphragm in an east to west direction in a horizontal direction and literally transmitted the forces through the roof rafters to the front wall of the building and again the, the roof rafters were just resting on ledges in the brick wall uh, the rear wall shown here for example And again, as viewed from an aerial photo perspective, that this horizontal displacement and the forces that it came along with it were simply transmitted through the roof rafters through the entire roughly 100 foot, 30 meter width of the building. So the next step in the causal mechanism these rafter forces and horizontal spacements push the front wall outward and again this is a photo I showed you earlier on uh, quite visible horizontal displacement and deformation as viewed from the street and the front wall of the building and as also measured in the interior you, it was a very visible gap of several inches between the vertical leg of this knee brace structural knee brace that had been installed and the brick wall and again we'll view this component of the causal mechanism from the perspective of the aerial photo so putting this causal mechanism together in a single animation we have the failure of the counterfort retaining wall sending debris against the rear wall of the building that debris generates a force that pushes the rear wall inward and in turn causes the north and south walls to bow outward the roof rafters transmit this force through the entire 100 foot 30 meter width of the building to the front wall pushing the front wall outward so as a comment we could see that these knee braces that were installed in the front wall of the building did absolutely nothing um, they were simply tying the front wall to the floor but 
that floor is moving outward as well. But essentially, the whole building was racking in a or shearing in a horizontal direction. So those knee braces were absolutely worthless. They were, they were a band-aid solution that simply was a waste of money because they did not address the cause of what was pushing that wall outward, which really originated in the rear wall of the building. So to sum things up with respect to this case history, uh, the root cause of the observed damage to the building was the failure of the counterfort retaining wall on the residential property to the rear of the building. Unfortunately, further forensic investigation to continue constructing this causal mechanism farther back in time uh, in order to determine uh, the root cause or causes of the retaining wall failure, possibly a trigger event of that wall failure, were not pursued. The client in this case was not interested uh, in funding further investigation. Uh, at the time that I was involved, there was no litigation uh, whether or not the building owner eventually sued the owner of the residential property. I have no idea. Um, I will say that, uh, again, this case history occurred in the early months of 1990. That building has since been torn down uh, some time ago and replaced by uh, another building. So I, I don't know what the eventual outcome was, whatever discussions were held with the owner of the commercial property or whatever. But it, 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 I will just say that this is one of the somewhat unsatisfying things sometimes of doing geostructural forensic investigations is that you would like to do more, uh, not just to run up the bill, but to just out of, an academic curiosity, if you will. I mean, in this case, yeah, I mean, it's a logical thing to want to know, well, what what caused the retaining wall to fail? What was, you know, what, what were the exact design details of the retaining wall, et cetera? Uh, and, and very often this is not possible simply because your client is not w willing to fund the time uh, to pursue these things further. Although no investigation was made into when this retaining wall might have failed relative to when I performed this forensic investigation in March, April 1990, the evidence I saw suggested the failure had occurred some years earlier. I mean, as you could see from the photos I showed you, uh, there were many, many small trees that had grown up on the slope. I mean, obviously, uh, these trees take several years to grow. So, I mean, the wall failure did not happen the day before. Um, and so I, I think the failure had occurred some years earlier and this downslope movement of debris against the rear wall of the building was uh, progressive uh, over a relatively long term and long term meaning uh, several years at least, perhaps even more than a decade, who knows. Um, Again, if I had to guess, the residential property probably dated to the early, very early part of the 20th century. The building that was impacted, the commercial building that was impacted by the wall failure, uh, probably, if I had to guess, built in the 1920s. So it's, it's very difficult to say when exactly this retaining wall failed. The chronic progressive nature of the failure, at least as, as I assumed it, is supported by the fact that even though there were several inches of out of plane displacement and distortion of all four exterior load bearing walls, imagine having an almost square box that you squeeze on one side so the other three sides kind of bulge. Um, there was absolutely no observed cracking in the brickwork anywhere. I mean, all of these Walls were inspected to the greatest extent practicable on the interior uh, and, and the exterior. And there was absolutely no cracking of any of the brickwork. And, and I think this is a very, very important lesson to be learned here that um, when you have 
cementitious materials, masonry materials, we tend to think of them as being very, fairly brittle in a stress strain perspective. And, and this is true, but it is true only in relatively short term loading. I mean, for example, you break a concrete cylinder or something like that. Uh, these materials will indeed behave in a brittle fashion. However, these same materials under very, very slowly applied long-term loading can be surprisingly ductile. And it's very important to understand the material science of materials when you're doing geostructural forensic investigations. I mean, if you look at, in this case, brick walls, or if you look at a... Uh, reinforced concrete retaining wall or something like that. Um, the, the absence, you know, we tend to look for cracks. Uh, that's very natural whenever we have masonry or, or concrete or something like that. It's natural to look for cracks to indicate displacement and deformation. But that's not a foolproof indicator. Uh, you have to be very, very careful. You have to make measurements. In this case, we, we measured the walls being out of plumb and things like that, sight along a wall. Um, simply sighting along a wall can be a very, very useful investigative technique. So you do have to be careful when you're working with uh, cementitious or masonry materials that the absence of cracking does not mean that there has not been any significant displacement or to end or deformation. Um, it simply means that that may have occurred over a long period of time, which is what I think happened in this case. So as I said, this ductile as opposed to brittle nature, the distortion of the brickwork in this case was to me indicative of a sustained, very slowly applied loading over time. Well, that brings me to the end of this presentation and uh, just some closing comments. I believe it's useful to reiterate the five overarching themes that experience, my experience has shown are really mission critical in performing a geostructural forensic investigation. Think broadly, which simply means uh, don't be constrained by your professional specialization and experience and in some cases, you need to involve other forensic specialists where appropriate. For example, in this case history, uh, I involved a colleague who was a structural engineering specialist initially um, because I wanted to make sure that although I do have structural engineering skills, I don't consider myself to be a specialist in structural engineering. And the initial indications from the client were that this was a structural problem. So I, I made sure that a structural specialist did the initial inspection and then handed it off to me when it appeared that there were external geotechnical issues going on. Think completely. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that forensic civil engineering is not design practice in reverse. Uh, you need to use state of knowledge analytical methodologies and methods in order to model the actual behavioral mechanisms as opposed to the simplistic and, and sometimes incorrect behaviors that are implicit in design methodologies and methods that you see as part of typical uh, codes, for example. Think granularly. Remember what, take the advice of Sherlock Holmes. There's no detail too small or too trivial uh, to consider in a geostructural forensic investigation. Investigate the trifles. Consider the trifles. Think independently. You need to use available factual information and develop additional factual information necessary to form an independent opinion. Uh, nowadays, I spend a lot of time looking at things online uh, researching as much as I can from online material when I'm involved in a forensic investigation. And of course, think honestly. You never want to cherry pick the facts to support a causal mechanism. When you develop a 
plausible causal mechanism and must be consistent with all the factual information. Uh, and I shouldn't have to say this, but I do, as well as the basic principles of math and science. Uh, gravity does not cease to exist when you're performing a forensic investigation. And although that may sound silly, I have unfortunately seen very notable civil engineers make some really incredible uh, statements of, you know, water flowing uphill and things like this, defying gravity uh, in their forensic engineering reports. So remember the five-pointed star. Think broadly, completely, granularly, independently, and honestly. And with that, I want to say thank you very much for your attention. And again, what I've presented here is just uh, scratches the surface of what I cover in this monograph that I published earlier this year. This is the ISBN number uh, for obtaining a copy. And this monograph is available uh, print on demand services worldwide from any online bookseller. It's a soft cover book and uh, it, it's printed throughout the world and available fairly short notice, generally within a few weeks, if not a few days, anywhere in the world. And with that, I will close out this presentation. Again, say thank you very much for your attention.